The thought experiment was today, suppose you were an electric charge, say you were a positive electric charge, walking about, walking about, you're positive, you're minding your own business, you're a positive electric charge. Describe a situation where you would always experience a buoyant force, something always kind of pushing you up. Now you're, you're a charge, you have mass, so there's gravity still in place, gravity is pulling you down, but you're feeling this buoyant force walking around. Can you think of any situation where you might feel sort of a lift, sure, Bob. Yeah, like, okay, if I was walking, like, if I was walking, maybe, like, whatever I'm walking on is, like, opposite, char opposite charge. An opposite or same charge? Opposite. Oh, no, 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 yeah. Sorry. Same charge. If I was standing, if I was standing on a positive charge, and I was a positive charge, I'd feel a blind force, right? Maybe we ought to get a little jacket we could put a positive charge on and then walk around as a positive charge and we'd be, we'd blind. But the thought experiment is a little bit more detailed than that. If it was only a point charge that you were standing on, or a boulder charge, or a stepping stone charge, if you stepped off of that charge, you would not no longer feel a force that was directly up because of the vector addition of the forces and that you're off to the side of it. Now you would still you would feel some force pushing you this way, and the more you got this way, you wouldn't be forced up anymore, you'd be forced that way. Right? So the situation is a little bit more complicated than just standing on a positive, standing on a positive stepping stone. Furthermore, the situation is a little bit complicated because I say that no matter whether you climbed a hill or not, you would still feel the same buoyant force. And that kind of goes against the inverse square law, that the further I get away from another charge, the, the force is less. This is what I wanted you to think about. I want you to continue to think about it because the whole ge geometry of the solution to the thought experiment is what we're going to be talking about today in, in good detail. You guys are probably very comfortable with the fact that non-contact forces act on objects at a distance. Action at a distance is, is what it's called. You're probably very comfortable with that notion. But back in Faraday's day, circa 1867, that kind of creeped people out. It kind of creeped people out that one thing could have an effect on another without being in contact with each other. It was a thing of magic and religion. And if you could, maybe you were some sort of a shaman that had a little bit of an alchemist science background, but you also knew the power of religion. Maybe you could convince people to join your religion or else you put some sort of a hex on them by having some sort of an action at a distance. So the history is filled with things like that. The history is filled with things like that. Michael Faraday knew better. He was a scientist and he says, uh, all this mumbo jumbo, hokey ancient warriors and ancient religions and weapons is, that's not, that's not for me. There's got to be some sort of an explanation. He was well aware of Coulomb's law and that two particles would have an effect on each other, a force on each other. So two particles that were positively charged would repel each other, and two particles that were oppositely charged would feel a force towards each other. But he couldn't un explain this whole thing that in the space between, in the space between, something happened. Because he knew if he manipulated the space in between, then all of a sudden the forces between the charges changed. So there must be a, not a direct relationship between one force or one particle and the other particle. There must be some sort of an indirect. There must be some sort of an indirect effect from one charged particle to the other charged particle. The direct effect, the direct effect was the particle in the space that surrounded it. So the particle responded to the space around it. When the space around it changed, the particle moved based on that force. That was Faraday's explanation, and that's what we call the electric field. The electric field is what goes on in between the charges, the space around the charges. That's what electric field is. We saw a real world, we saw a real world example 
of electric field when I gave you guys a little demonstration of the cathode ray tube. Cathode ray tube. It was that funky shaped tooth like this. Source of electrons, so some sort of element that you get really hot and you boil off electrons. And on the face of the cathode ray tube, the face of the television, there's a positive on the cathode, the face of it, a uh, very strong positive charge. And then these negative charges are sitting in this bucket here, ready to be released into the evacuated chamber. When, it, when, you, when these electrons get loose, then they make a B line for the front of the cathode ray tube. It's pretty boring if that's all that happened. But instead, I said, well, we manipulate this beam by putting two plates inside the tube. And we connect it together to a battery. And then, if we put a charge on these plates, so this would be the positive connection to the battery. And this would be the negative connection to the battery. So the negative electrons would be go over here and pile up on this side of the plate in response to the positive charge on that side of the plate. Then all of a sudden, the electron beam we can manipulate. The beam is manipulated. These, now keep in mind that these particles are moving at a very high rate of speed towards the cathode. And we can't stop them unless we really turn up the voltage, but we can deflect them. So if this is negative, then they would be attracted to the positive plate, and we can actually bend the beam. Conversely, if we flip the charges, if we flip, flip the battery around, we can lift it up. And if we do that enough times, we can dither it back and forth, and if we have plates in both the, in both the X and Y direction, then we can point that beam to wherever we want it to. We can paint a picture on the screen, and we do that in a fraction of a second. If we do that enough times, all of a sudden the pictures, individual pictures, become moving pictures. And so that's how television came about. Flat screen TV, totally different technology. But CRTs is a great the electric field. So why was I talking about the cathode ray tube? Because we set up an electric field between these two plates. Again, I want to be talking about this particular geometry a lot today, and I wanted to engage your prior knowledge of this configuration because we actually did talk about it when we talked about the cathode ray tube. Michael Faraday did something for humanity that was pretty profound. When he came up with the theory of the electric field, and he proposed a way that we can control the electric field, then he gave us the power to control things like the electron beam. And if it wasn't for the being able to control the electron beam, we would have never had television, we would never have the kind of entertainment options that we do today. So in the least, we can thank Michael Faraday for Netflix. Let's think about this configuration for a little bit. These two plates inside here. This is really the solution to the bell work. So the bell work I proposed, and sure, Bon, you got right. If I'm standing on a positive step, step stone, stepping stone, then I'm going to feel that buoyant force. Mm -hmm. But if I step off the stepping stone, then it's not going to push me directly up. But what's the solution to that problem? Put another one down. Put another one down. And another one, 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 until the whole ground is positively charged. And so no matter where you walked on the positive charge, you would be buoyed up. Right? But that's not the end of the thought experiment. It says no matter how high you climb, you still feel the same force. And that flies against the, what we already know from Coulomb's law, the inverse square law. It's an inverse square law. So the further you get away the charge, the less the force is. Unless you had a complementary negative charge in the ceiling. Okay. So then if you strapped on your positive charge suit, and you stepped and you feel buoyed, if you got halfway up, now you start to feel the effects of the negative charge pulling you up. Now we had a pretty smart student first, he's like, first period. He says, why wouldn't you just go stick to the ceiling anyway? Because there's a couple of different forces involved. 
But it's not only the electric force that's pushing you up. We draw our electric field forces from positive to negative. Electric field forces from positive to negative. But we also have to consider that charge has mass. It's matter. Remember, the charge comes from matter. Charge is Charges are charged pieces of matter, ions or electrons. So they have mass. All matter has mass, right? So there's a force of gravity on the particle as well, right? And we know that the force of gravity is just mass times acceleration of gravity at a particular place. And then the force of electricity is simply that constant times Q1 and Q2 divided by R squared. So these are the two forces in opposition. If we can set up a situation with positive and negative plates above and below us and put on our positive suit, then we can levitate. Pretty cool idea. It would be pretty cool if you probably didn't shock yourself when you got stuck in the wall.